good evening to all my friends here in India and outside. I am stepping in for Mohini today. She seems to be having a whale of a time in Turkey. She sent us some nice pictures up in the air while we're down on the ground in front of our laptops. So I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Prashant Sinha. Uh, he's going to speak about an extremely renowned novel in the history of uh, uh, French literature, The Red and the Black by Stendhal. Stendhal was one of uh, France's pioneering novelists. Now, Professor Sinha has already made uh, presentations at the book club before. I certainly remember the two presentations he made, one on Albert Camus and one on Franz Kafka. May, he may have made others, I don't recall them, but these two important uh, writers he certainly spoke about. Now, Professor Sinha has actually taught English in different colleges and different universities. And uh, his last tenure was at, as head of department of English in the University of Pune, now Savitri Bhagfule. He has also been a member of uh, the UGC Committee on the Discipline of English and Foreign Languages, and has also been on the CDC, which is the Curriculum Development Committee. He is the, uh, he has written and edited and co-edited some eight books. He has penned scores of articles in reputed journals, both in India and outside. A major publication of his was, the, was Vintage Shakespeare, and the most recent publication is Interpretations of Literature, Theory and Practice. Now, Professor Zina uh, is, has retired, but he continues to lecture in some universities, and he's a visiting fellow in some other universities. So we have a very uh, uh, qualified, overqualified, super qualified uh, Professor Prashant Sinat who speak to us about one of the major works in the history of, French, of the French novel. Over to you, Professor Sinat. Uh, thank you, Latika, for the wonderful introduction. Very flattering, I must say. And I'm so glad that the chairperson for the meeting today is somebody who has considerable exposure to France and French literature. And, but my fear is that you will keep on correcting my pronunciation of <laughs> French. You see, I did my French for PhD and I have forgotten almost all of it. Oh. Let's see. Uh, I'm delighted to be back here. Uh, I don't know how many times I've come here because before, uh, uh, you know, I joined the book club, I used to come for in between. That, that was another group uh, that Mohini and Satish and the friends uh, ran. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here, and I hope we have uh, a fairly interactive session. Now, I begin by saying that uh, Henry Bale, I'll start the first slide now, slide one. Uh, Henry Bale, uh, whose pseudonym was Stendhal, uh, was a major figure uh, in French fiction. He wrote two remarkable novels. The second one was called The Charter House of Parma, uh, written in 1839, Le Chatrouge de Parma. And the first one, which we'll discuss, is The Red and the Black. Uh, that is uh, Le Rouge uh, a la uh, uh, Soir. Uh, and uh, the second novel was written in the late 1820s, uh, but uh, could not be uh, published till as late as 1830-31. There were certain objections raised against the publication by critics, and therefore the publication uh, took its own time. Uh, in fact, the first translation in English uh, appeared only around the turn of the century. See, because for England, it was uh, in many ways uh, a shocking novel, you know, which uh, celebrates and shows uh, the hero uh, having affairs with uh, two women. The period during which uh, he wrote The Red and the Black uh, was uh, the post-Napoleonic period. As you know, in 1789, when they had the famous French Revolution, or the, shall I say, the notorious French Revolution, uh, they killed uh, the reigning Bourbons. Uh, King Louis XVI on the throne, his famous wife, Marie Antoinette, uh, who said, the people don't have bread, why don't they have cake? I believe it's not true, but anyway, she's supposed to have said it, and his children. But they couldn't kill the brothers. 
1815, when uh, Napoleon, uh, uh, when uh, Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo and was exiled to Saint Helena, uh, they had the restoration of the Bourbons. The brother, I suppose, the uh, cousin of Louis the Sixteenth, uh, took over as uh, Louis the Eighteenth, and he ruled for nine years. And then in 1824, uh, his brother Charles X uh, took over. Charles was a reactionary and he wanted to revive the era before 1789. As we all know, uh, history doesn't move backwards. History only moves forward. And so there are problems, many pol political problems. And there was intense rivalry between those who wanted to preserve uh, the privileges of uh, the ancient nobility, uh, which were destroyed both during the revolution and during the uh, 11, actually it was much longer because Napoleon before becoming emperor was the first council and director and so on before Napoleon's era. And those who wanted to perpetuate Napoleon's reforms. So there were the liberals and the reactionaries. King Charles X was a reactionary. He nominated as the president of the council, that's like our prime minister, uh, people who supported uh, the monarchist group. And finally, was overthrown in 1830. Uh, the title of the novel is a Red and the Black. And I'm so glad uh, that Tushar has given these two colors to the slides. The red uh, has been seen uh, both as the army and as republicanism. The black clearly stands for the uh, church. Now, let me mention why these two are important. See, because uh, uh, in those days, given the privileges that are still preserved for the upper classes, somebody born in the lower class, and our hero was born as a carpenter's son, could not really rise in the world except through the church or through the army. Even the army had certain limitations because even now commissions were given uh, on the basis of privileges, birth and influence. So, you know, this was the title of the novel. The initial setting, uh, in fact, setting for quite some time, is in the small town of Varier. Var I mean, initially we are slow, then we move faster. Uh, the Varier is a, a, a small town of 20,000 people, almost like a Taluka place, shall I say, in Maharashtra. And it has a mayor. Uh, the mayor has a, a, a nail factory, and there are a few industries, but by and large, farms around. The mayor the Renal, you can see from the name that he obviously had connections with the nobility, uh, is a man of 45, energetic, um, um, dynamic, and very keen to make his way up in the world. His wife is a young lady, uh, almost 30, or about 30. Uh, she has come from a slightly uh, nobler family, and she feels ignored and neglected in the household. But she has remained uh, uh, as a good church woman, uh, a chaste wife. Uh, okay. The epigraph of book one is La Verite, La Pre Verite, the truth, the harsh truth, attributed to uh, Danton, one of the revolutionary firebrand leaders of the French Revolution. He also, like many other leaders, was guillotined as expected in the reign of two. Slide two. Julian Sorel, uh, the hero of the novel, was a son of a carpenter, uh, but uh, he was uh, no good in carpentry. He hated his father's profession. He hated the work he was given. He just loved books, uh, and he was all the time reading books. He was a bookworm, and for that, the father disliked him intensely. Finally, the father, who was a very shrewd person, uh, worked out a deal. Uh, with the mayor. The mayor wanted to improve his social status. And for that, he must have a tutor uh, for his three sons. Now, Julian has a reputation of having a prodigious memory and being an extremely uh, you know, well-read person. In fact, you could recite uh, parts of the Bible by heart. So that uh, helped him. And the father worked out very, very uh, you know, shrewd uh, uh, terms. The boy was going to live, he's just about 19, uh, going to live in the house. Uh, he'll be treated not like a menial, uh, 
uh, he'll be treated uh, like a member of the family. Uh, and he'll also uh, have free food. Uh, so, you know, and he'll have a salary. So with these conditions, Julian joined the family and he began a close interaction uh, with the woman of the house, Madame de Reyna, who is 10 years older, as you said, she's almost 30 and she has three sons. Uh, and uh, he's drawn towards her. He had never seen uh, any upper class woman. And remember, uh, although the husband now has a nail factory and has in some ways moved away from the profession or the traditional uh, nobility, now he's earning his own living. Uh, you know, uh, she is basically upper class. So Julian had never meant uh, any interaction, never had any interaction with an upper class lady and is fascinated by Madame de Reynal. Uh, there's another important woman in the house and that is her maid, Elise. Elise uh, is interested in Julian. Uh, she gets a fortune and now she thinks she can afford uh, to marry Julian. After all, uh, now she's going to move up in the world. But Julian doesn't respond to her. He's in love with Madame Rena, who also loves him, although he's only a carpenter's son. Madame Rena has two problems. Uh, first of all, uh, here is uh, a young man who is far inferior to her in class and status. And uh, secondly, she has been uh, living the life of a chaste wife. How can she have an adult relationship uh, with a young man who is as many as 10, 11 years younger, just a few years older than the oldest uh, son? Uh, given all this uh, uh, you know, conflict, Julian simply goes away on a holiday for three days. He joins a very, very close friend, Folk, who in fact remains loyal to him till the very end of the novel. Uh, Folk has got his own carpentry uh, shop uh, and Folk asks him to join him as a partner. Julian says no because his heart is with Madame de Renal, uh, and uh, so he comes back. Shall we come back to the next slide, slide three? Uh, now, we observe the inner conflicts of both. Julian, uh, being a person from the working class, after all, a carpenter who was just a working class person, has great fear and diffidence. Uh, he just cannot approach uh, Madame de Reynol. And Madame has got all her compunctions against uh, sleeping with a young man who is not her husband. And remember, now there is not much romantic relationship left between the wife and the husband. Finally, one day against her conscious wishes, after days and days of long walks, he just enters her bedroom uh, through a ladder. And uh, since these people were quite rich, uh, Mrs. Reynolds or Madame de Reynolds had her own separate bedroom. Uh, she initially resists, but deep down uh, she wanted him and so she throws herself into his arms. The lovers have a sexual consummation, by the way, uh, given the mores of the time, uh, it is never said openly uh, that uh, Julian uh, uh, sleeps with Madame Reynold. It's implied and implied so vigorously that there can be no doubt about what is being said. Now he spends hours with her only there. Uh, this morning, not only this morning, but every morning, every night he goes and spends hours with her. Lest we get involved with personal relations completely, we are taken back to the political situation. There is uh, the complicated local politics. The king is coming uh, during this time. King Charles X, as we observed, was a reactionary and a great believer in relics and so on. He's coming to the cathedral, uh, which is not very far from here. I guess about 10, 15, uh, uh, 20 miles. Not, uh, I guess the French would always think about kilometers, uh, not more than that, which then was not very close. Uh, and uh, he wants to go to the cathedral. And for that, there is elaborate, uh, very elaborate uh, kind of uh, reception. Uh, the job of the town of Varier is to provide him a guard of honor. There are a lot of cavaliers on horseback and Madame de Renal uh, persuades uh, the organizers to have Julian as one of the cavaliers. And that raises the heckles of many people. After all, uh, Julian, 
uh, was a carpenter's son. How could he be uh, in this uh, cavalry along with people who are richer uh, and have a higher status? Uh, so uh, now he is uh, uh, the object of jealousy of many people. Uh, next slide. Uh, there is another thing that is important. Uh, remember, they have to have a number of deputy mayors, and they have to choose the first deputy mayor. And that's the point in which uh, uh, Monsieur Reynal, the mayor, disagrees with a lot uh, of uh, the local people who are opposed to him. Uh, and uh, Elise, who has been turned down like a woman is spurned, uh, she joins uh, uh, Monsieur Valenon. Uh, who is a great rival uh, of uh, the mayor and they write a letter uh, to the mayor about his wife's affair with Julian. But uh, Madame de Reynal shows surprising shrewdness. I thought she was too simple to handle the situation, but she handles it well. Uh, she convinces her husband that the letter is a malicious letter written by M. Valenon uh, because uh, he had been spurned by her. Remember, she is a beautiful woman, uh, much younger than her husband. So a lot of local people uh, wanted to woo her, but she as a chaste wife had turned them all down. So the husband is convinced uh, about it. At the same time, with great uh, hypocrisy, uh, she insists that Julian be dismissed. After all, she has to show that she is respectable. She has to preserve a good name. Julian is now patronized by all the rivals, and enemies uh, of uh, the mayor. One of them is an important functionary. He's a sub prefect, as you perhaps know. I think uh, Latika would know if it's prefect or prefet. Perhaps prefet. It's, prefet. Uh, prefet. So France was divided into a set of uh, departments, almost like our bigger districts, and each one had a prefet at the top. And in each one of the uh, big units in the district, there was a sub prefect. So there's a sub prefect here uh, who administratively is superior uh, to the mayor, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, jealousy. So they also, they all want Julian to be the tutor to their sons. After all, Julian has a fantastic memory, uh, has books by heart and has read a lot and is young. Uh, so Julian now uh, has encounters with many rivals uh, of the mayor. Another very important event that had ha happens parallelly is the dismissal, as it were, the removal of M. Shelan, the curé uh, from his church. M. Shelan is very upright, uh, very noble, uh, a man of great integrity, mm -hmm. and he is deprived of his church mm -hmm. by the political opponents uh, of the mayor. Uh, and his supporters, especially the liberals, okay. rush to help him, uh, but he maintains his independence. In fact, the liberals offered him a free house, which was a very big thing uh, for a poor clergyman, but he says no. But help pours in from a lot of sources, including his protege, uh, that is uh, Julian. Julian goes to his father's place, uh, picks up a number of uh, pieces of wood and makes several bookshelves uh, for the curé. The curé uh, likes him and advises him to leave the town. So Julian now goes to Besançon, uh, that is almost uh, like uh, a district town, and that has a cathedral in it. The first thing Julian does when he goes there is to go for coffee to a small place, and there he falls in love with the young waitress, Amanda Bine. In fact, even without knowing her fully well, he goes to her and tells her, I love you intensely. <laughs> Before he could proceed any further, uh, they are joined by a tall, hefty, mustachious man who is one of the many admirers of Amanda, who is a beautiful waitress. And they give him a contemptuous look, and Julian has to beat a hasty retreat. Uh, next slide. Now, Julian enters the seminary. The entire entry in the seminary is seen through Julian's eyes. Uh, Julian is overawed by the place. Uh, he had never really been to any such massive place and is overawed also by the functionaries there. 
He faints, in fact, while waiting. Uh, and uh, he also didn't have a huge meal. But uh, the director, Pirat, uh, is impressed by him. He's impressed by his knowledge uh, and his memory and uh, his keenness to go up uh, in the profession. Uh, on the other hand, we come back to Madame de Renaud. She is now doing penance for adultery. Uh, she thinks uh, that what she's done was wrong. Uh, she goes to the same cathedral, which is very close to the seminary and uh, for penance. And there she faints when she recognizes Julian. Julian is arranging a few things uh, for an important event for the bishop. Uh, and uh, uh, Julian doesn't know uh, that she has partly renounced him. Julian is, is now going to make his way up in the world. He's appointed secretary to Marquis de la Mole, the most important functionary, the most important nobleman in the whole area. As you know, Marquis are next only to ducks, uh, second in the rank of uh, nobility. And de la Mole is very, very keen, uh, determined to become a duke and also to join uh, an important position uh, in the court. So Julian is appointed secretary to Marquis de la Mole. Uh, because he had asked uh, the two clergymen to do so, they recommended uh, Julian. And he's told to depart for Paris. Before leaving town, uh, he wants to renew his contacts with Madame de Renault. And as usual, yeah. once again, he takes a ladder and jumps into a bedroom. Uh, this time she resists. She tells him, leave immediately. She no longer feels the same sentiments for him. She had confessed adultery to her husband. And now she wants to uh, turn over a new leaf. But Julia uh, you know, cries, coaxes her, woos her, and finally he gets his way. So as we are told, he finally obtained all he desired for the two. You observe how uh, discreet uh, um, uh, uh, the novelist is. doesn't mention exactly that that, that is sexual consummation, which is precisely what happened. Uh, now, she, as she puts it, she's backslided from her life as a chaste wife. Uh, she is no longer the new person she had wanted to be. Uh, now with this, we uh, enter uh, the second book. Uh, slide six. Next slide. Uh, a new world is open to Julian once he enters the place of the Marquis. Junior finds uh, the conversation of the distinguished visitors to the Marquis very, very dull and boring. You see, the Marquis wanted him to be present at all the meetings because he has a fabulous memory. He could listen to everything, uh, use his notes, and reproduce everything. And the Marquis, as someone who is politically aspiring uh, to higher offices, who wants to be uh, an important functionary at the court, and also a duke, uh, he is now depending heavily on Julian to report on what is happening. So he can go up in the world. Now there, he meets a, a very important person, that is Matilda, the daughter of the family. Matilda is 18, barely 19, I think just about 18. Uh, and uh, she is a flirt, uh, she is a coquette, uh, and uh, you know, she loves uh, men uh, who don't respond to her. Uh, she loves the challenges in the sexual relationships. Julian uh, doesn't approach her. Uh, although they are, she encounters him frequently, he's in the same house uh, and he works in the office uh, of the uh, Marquis. He's there for the whole day. So, but Julian is diffident. He knows that he's very inferior in terms of class. Uh, she is from the highest nobility almost, next only to dukes. Uh, and uh, he's only a carpenter. So he stays away from her. In the meantime, the Marquis who depends heavily on him and loves him, sends him to London and he comes back accomplishing his mission. So observe how we are now taken beyond the confines uh, of uh, the small town of Varie. We are taken to the larger city uh, of Besançon. It's almost a city. Then we'll go to places like London and Paris and so on. Finally, in exasperation, uh, Matilda sends him a love letter, but the love letters don't invite much of an answer from him. He's very afraid. He doesn't know 
uh, what she is like and what she will do. Because you observe that, you know, uh, she is uh, far more complex and in some ways far more sophisticated than Madame de Reynal, who was in some ways a uh, simple uh, woman. Uh, next slide. Uh, see, Julian uh, doesn't feel love for Matilda, uh, although she had invited him uh, one day uh, to see her at one o'clock in the morning. They met, uh, and uh, you can easily guess what happened, what transpired then. Now she became his mistress. No, but she is not constant. Uh, he is all the time afraid uh, that she is trying to trap him, uh, that uh, uh, you know she wants to have the upper hand. And there's a singular absence of warmth between them. You know, although uh, in some ways, at least they are sexual lovers, uh, though not uh, uh, frequently, they are not really uh, warm towards each other. She doesn't find any happiness in the love affair. Those who have read uh, the immortal novel of Flaubert, Madame Bovary, would remember Madame Bovary read plenty of romantic books, but found that in real life, love was nowhere close to that. Uh, those romantic books. Something similar happens to Julian. Uh, sorry, something similar happens to Matilda. She also realizes that in real life, love is not what she had read about in the books. They take long walks together, and during each of the long walks, she talks about other people who admire her. After all, she is rich, beautiful, accomplished, uh, and the daughter of the most important man in the entire vicinity. Uh, this makes him very jealous, and she feels happy uh, that uh, he is jealous, he is desperate. You observe how uh, she is playing a game, and Julian also uh, is now trying to learn the game. See, with Madame de Reynal, it was simple, but now it's, things are far more complicated. Matilda, in fact, assured now of being adored, despised him utterly. Next slide. Uh, they are both torn by uh, inner conflicts because remember, they are both very young people. <clears throat> uh, he is around 20 now, or slightly older than 20, and she is uh, still a teenager. They both fall sick as a result uh, of inner conflicts. Finally, he has the same solution that he had to Madame de Renal. He takes a ladder and enters a bedroom <laughs> through a ladder. I guess a ladder may stand for the ladder of success or whatever it be. Uh, he jumps into a room and they have a night of passion. But immediately she repents. She repents everything that she has done with him. And she tells him, I don't love you anymore. He is not able to contrast, uh, to take this uh, given his experience uh, with a simpler and older lady, Madame de Reynal. Julian is trusted more and more uh, by the Marquis, uh, who asks him to join secret conclaves so that he can take all the notes and give them back uh, to his master. At one of these, there is a meeting at VIP's place. They're planning a conspiracy uh, and uh, he is going to jot everything down and report the matter to his master. Remember, there are two important groups in France. Uh, one is of those who believed in Napoleon's cause uh, and who are in some way the liberals and the other is of reactionaries who want to go back to uh, the ancient regime, it's called, uh, to the old era. And the choice of the president of the council, that is the prime minister, uh, was made by uh, King Charles X in such a way that only those who were royalists and reactionaries uh, took power. As a result, as you perhaps know, in 1830 he was deposed and there was a new king, citizen king, but uh, our novel doesn't take us beyond that point. Uh, he is sent to uh, Strasbourg uh, by his master. Strag Strasbourg, as you know, is a very important place. Uh, it has been a, a, a locality of dispute between France and Germany. Uh, it was in France for some time, uh, was uh, taken over by Prussia uh, when Bismarck's forces marched into Paris and removed uh, King Napoleon uh, III from the throne. And there was a commune in Paris. And then in 19... Uh, 19, when the Allies won the war against Germany, it was taken back and ceded to France. And during the Second World War, Hitler again occupied it 
and put it back in Germany. I think now Strasbourg is in France to the best of my knowledge. Uh, so there he, me he meets important people because remember, it was a disputed territory and lots of Frenchmen and Germans were there. But he meets a very, very interesting person called Prince Korasov, a Russian emigre. He is an expert in the art of seduction, as, <laughs> as the novelist says. Korasov advises him on how uh, to woo a lady, how to succeed in romance. It tells him, you pretend to court some other lady, thus to make your woman uh, jealous and then win her back. Korasov actually is a set uh, of love letters, all false love letters, uh, all piled up. Uh, and for every occasion, he has got a love letter. Uh, so following his advice, Julian pretends to court a very influential widow, uh, a lady called Madame B. Uh, for Vaku. Uh, she is the wife, the widow of a marshal. And remember, uh, Napoleon had appointed just a few marshals. And for a long time, there were no marshals in France till the First World War started. So she's very influential. And she is a great moralist. But ironically, she is moved by the letters sent by Julian. And she gets interested in him. But this has a desired effect that Julian uh, wanted. Uh, next slide. Matilda feels jealous and wants to come back to Julian, but he is now going to play the game his way. He wants to keep her wondering uh, and uh, things may go on like this, but something very important happens. Remember that they were together for several nights and Matilda discovers that she is pregnant by Julian. Now she wants to marry him, but her father refuses to let her wed a person of inferior class and status. Her father had many ambitions about his daughter's ma marriage. He wanted her to marry somebody of a very high uh, class, someone socially superior, and thereby uh, to rise in the world. Now the opposite has happened. Uh, he is very upset. He refuses to let her marry uh, this young man. In fact, he sends for Julian and pulls him up very severely. Uh, he decides to know all about Julian's past so that he could expose her com him completely to his daughter and break off the affair. He heard, has heard about uh, Madame de Reynal. After, remember, they are roughly uh, within 100, 150 kilometers of each other. Uh, now, Madame de Reynal uh, has been influenced by her confessors. She goes to the church regularly and she replies to the letter of uh, the Marquis. Uh, as dictated by a priest confessor. The priest confessor wants to end this affair once and for all. He dictates a letter saying uh, that Julian is a terrible person, is an adventurer. Uh, he just uses his position as a tutor in the families uh, or as secretary in the families to enter uh, the bedrooms of noblemen to seduce their ladies and to use that leverage uh, as a position of power to climb up in the world. Immediately, uh, the Marquis shows the letter to Julian. Julian is so upset. He believes that uh, his former mistress wrote this letter, uh, you know, sincerely. He rushes to a church where he knows uh, she goes for confession and he fires a shot at her. Luckily, she is not mortally wounded, uh, not even critically wounded, but he's in prison. After all, the law abiding offi law, law officers know uh, that the Marquis doesn't like this young man for his son-in-law. Uh, next uh, slide. Julian discovers in the prison that the Reynal had written a letter dictated by a priest. It was not a, a true uh, expression of her feelings. He repents, but now it's too late. The shot can't be undone. He decides to say goodbye, uh, not only uh, to the women, uh, but to life itself. And of course, to Matilda more than to anyone else. He is now put in a dungeon where he receives uh, Abbe Shelan, who still remains a real well-wisher of his, uh, Folk, his close friend, and Matilda in disguise. Matilda has assumed the identity 
of a maid servant and has come there. All the judicial officers and the warden have been heavily bribed. So they let Matilda enter, even when they find out that she is uh, the daughter of the Marquis. And Matilda has passionate hours with him. Still, Julian thinks about his first love, Madame de Reynol, and keeps her talking to Matilda about her. And that disturbs her greatly. Uh, next slide. Matilda, who now loves uh, Julian uh, sincerely, makes the widest plans to uh, save uh, him from the gallows. Now she is passionate and devoted to him, but it all leaves him cold. He wants her to marry his rival, Marquis, the Cross of Noir. You can see from the name that he is of a very high social status. Julian is now determined to die. In this situation, uh, he is full of uh, despair, but one day uh, he observes in a stupor, tears falling on his hands. He opens his eyes and sees Madame de Reynal is there. She uh, herself has uh, bribed the officials and entered the uh, jail. And uh, now she is willing to save him even at the cost of respectability. Remember when she was dismissed from her household, that was to maintain her respectability. But now she's willing to do uh, to get rid of her respectability. She writes to all the jurors telling him uh, that she is not dead, she's alive and well, and therefore they, they mustn't pass the death sentence on him. But there's also counter influence. There's local politics. And remember the jury, jury uh, are not people with legal training. The jury is people with prejudices and the jury decide to send him to the gallows, partly because they feel this way they'll be obliging the Marquis. Uh, next slide. Now, Madame de Rena also uh, visits Julian twice a day. She meets him intimately. You observe that all these sexual encounters, amorous encounters, are described very discreetly. Uh, she says she'll go to Paris and throw herself at the feet of King Charles X. She says, I'll confess freely that you are my lover. Now she's not bothered about her good name. Now she's so concerned about her lover. But uh, Julian just wants to die. He faces death with great courage. Uh, he has been compared uh, to Camus' uh, hero, Meursol. So Meursol also uh, doesn't care if he lives or dies. In fact, Meursol wants to die. But as we observe, there's a difference. Uh, Julian uh, doesn't die for the same reasons. Julian dies bravely uh, and Matilda follows his corpse to the tomb, showing a great love for him. In the meantime, Matilda's admirer, uh, the Marquis, has been killed in a duel. Now she doesn't have any person to go back to. She, of course, she'll go back to her father, but we don't know what happened to her later. There's no epilogue as such. But Madame de Reno dies only three days after Julian's death in the manner of a uh, true uh, lover. Uh, now, I've given you a very, very detailed summary of the novel, partly because I guess, except uh, Latika, perhaps no one has read the novel. Uh, and uh, uh, now I'll come to a few observations uh, on the uh, novel. Slide 13. Stondhal's depiction of France. As, as we observed, the novel uh, is twofold. On the one hand, uh, it goes deep into the psychology of uh, three important characters. On the other hand, it shows us a graphic, vivid picture of contemporary France. Now, as I say here, Stendhal's graphic picture of the contemporary society includes one, class distinction and class conflicts. See, their lifestyles are different. Uh, they lead different kinds of lives. Uh, for example, in the highest nobility, it's very common for women to flirt. And, you know, they have all these uh, salons and conversations uh, in the evening, whereas the, the working classes have to uh, earn their living, although <laughs> some working class women were often the mistresses of rich noblemen. And the middle class, governed partly by middle class morality uh, has uh, to observe certain forms. <laughs> then the novel shows civil, military, 
and ecclesiastical ceremonials. There is all round corruption and nepotism, especially in law enforcement. This, as we all know, is universal. Very few, uh, uh, I mean, uh, police officials, judiciary, as far as we know, are honest. Perhaps uh, England, till about uh, 50, 60 years ago, army commissions are still given on recommendations of influential personage. Napoleon had ended the system. In Napoleon's time, it was all a question of merit. Uh, but now things have gone back to the old days. And you observe that the church is politicized. Normally, the churches are supposed to be independent of politicians. Uh, but the church is politicized. Those who have read uh, T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral would remember how uh, the uh, British church, in spite of being dominated uh, by uh, the royalty, has tried to preserve its independence. Now, here there is intense level of politics in the church, and uh, there's a lot of pettiness. Most of the inmates in the seminary are children of peasants who have joined the seminary because they could not think of uh, any better place where they could eat well uh, and live well uh, and earn a living. And they are jealous of this young man who is so learned, so scholarly, uh, who has such a wonderful memory and who is constantly going up in the world. Next slide. Uh, Stendhal's vision uh, goes back to that of some of the 18th century uh, French materialistic philosophers, especially uh, a rather obscure person called Helvetius, who believed that man is formed entirely by sensations and experiences in a mechanical way, and that self-love, self-interest, and the search for pleasure and power are the sole motives of human behavior. Remember, there's a change in uh, the theory of psychology uh, with Locke, uh, the uh, very distinguished uh, British uh, writer on psychology, the mind, politics, social system, and so on. Uh, now, Helvetius was also a materialist, uh, and uh, he is keenly interested uh, in the processes of the mind. He totally ignores uh, the religious ideas. Uh, in fact, in some ways, like the British uh, uh, political scientist and philosopher, uh, Hobbes, it's further mentioned that men, though they are forced to cooperate to survive, are all enemies, using each other, victimizing each other ruthlessly. And this is shown even in Magic Love. In fact, Stendhal uh, wrote a book called De L'Amour, 1822, much before he wrote this novel, a book written on love by Stendhal, where he says that even lovers try to use each other and they're enemies of each other. Uh, the final slide. Uh, I'll just talk about a few important characters. Remember, the novel is built on the old age principle of the so-called eternal triangle. There are two women of Julian, but what's important is that the second woman enters his life only after his life with the first woman has virtually ended because he uh, comes into contact with Matilda only after he and Madame Re de Renault have been separated. The triangle renews itself towards the very end when he's on the verge of dying. Uh, now with Madame de Renault, uh, it's a simpler affair. Uh, she is a simple woman. She has been a chaste wife uh, till she met uh, Julian and fell in love with him. And, uh, you know, she wants to lead a simple, ordinary life, comparatively. Whereas uh, uh, Matilda is a flirt. She enjoys power and domination. And she is torn between two impulses. One impulse is uh, to resist anyone dominating her. She must dominate everyone. But at the same time, she also loves submission. So she is, in some ways, a very, very complex character. And so is, in some ways, Julian. Uh, the Renault provides, in a sense, the Oedipal angle uh, in the novel. Uh, she is more than 10 years older than uh, Julian, and she provides a kind of protective maternal warmth. She is also a very loving mother. She has three sons, and you observe that at one time when the youngest son uh, falls sick, she's quite disturbed and says, this is God's punishment to her for having 
an adulterous lover. But she is, in a sense, almost like a, a mother mistress to Julian. You observe that the novel shows uh, with two characters, agony in love and love-hate relationship. Julian and Matilda have this kind of equation. Now, there's sadism uh, and masochism. Sadism, as we all know, is a desire uh, to pain others, and masochism is a desire uh, to be pained by others. I'm putting it in a very, very crude terms, and usually they have association uh, with sexuality. So sadist is one who enjoys inflicting pain on others, and masochist is one who enjoys pain inflicted on him. So in many ways, Julian and Matilda, especially Matilda, are sadist and masochist. Finally, I end with a romantic death wish in Julian. Julian uh, is like Merso, apparently, because both of them desire to die. But Julian is not an existential hero. He is not conscious of existential philosophy. Uh, Julian, in a sense, is like uh, uh, the romantic heroes who desire death. Uh, those who have been familiar with German literature, at least with the greatest figure, perhaps in European literature, Goethe, would recall that Goethe made his f name first with a very romantic novel called The Sorrows of Young Goethe, a novel that was popular with Napoleon. If I may take a minute, you see, when Napoleon's army entered uh, uh, Frankfurt, the house of Goethe, the soldiers rushed in, uh, they started looting, destroying things, and Goethe was uh, sitting contemplating something. One soldier ru rushed to him and put his sword next to his neck. Then someone said, stop, stop, is our emperor's favorite novelist. Have we lost the audio? Yeah, I think you have lost the audio. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Where is he? Prashant Sena. Prashant, we cannot hear you. Uh, internet, is, uh, internet is also uh, not stable. I think he has uh, finished most of it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if my voice can be heard by anybody. Uh, your voice can be heard. I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me. But yeah, she I'll can't be heard that. by anybody. Now, if I were to ask any yeah, question... Yes, come back. Prashant, Prashant, can you unmute yourself? I'll share the screen again. Uh, Prashant, can you continue? One minute. I'll just put your screen on. Okay. Uh, actually, I... Uh, uh, where was I when uh, you were speaking Lord, about Goethe? You were speaking about Goethe, 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 after which we didn't hear you. The sword ah. next to his neck. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, but then somebody said, another soldier said, "Stop, stop!" He's our emperor's favorite novelist. I, I, the emperor will not forgive you if you kill him. So Goethe's life was spared, uh, and actually, a lot of young men. This is a, a part of what is known as the storm and stress movement in Germany in, in 1770s, a lot of European young men read the novel and committed suicide as part of a certain fashion. Of course, Napoleon did not, but Napoleon had read the novel seven times, I believe. Can you believe, associate the two? Uh, and uh, those who have re been reading, John Keats remember his famous line, I've been half in love with easeful death. So there was this uh, tendency towards death, wish, and romanticism. And I think Julian represents that because remember, the time of the novel is the 1820s. Uh, that's a time uh, when the first wave of romanticism uh, was ending uh, in England. Uh, in uh, Germany, it ended earlier. Uh, in uh, France, the first wave ended around this time. People like Victor Hugo came much later. Uh, so uh, there was this interesting uh, fact about Julian's desire to die. And that, I think, I'll attribute to uh, the romanticism of the time. I only hope it doesn't uh, spread here. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed the session. We're very happy to answer any questions and to listen to your observations and ideas. 
Well, thank you, Professor Sina, for uh, recounting to us the story first of this long and complicated and complex novel. Uh, the story is complicated, and I can see that the background and everything that you explained is pretty complex also. You explained uh, in terms of the materialist philosophy, uh, against in, which is the background against which this novel and this story is set, which seems to be pretty ruthless. <laughs> you uh, spoke about the life of Julian, and you did a lot of, spoke about characterization also. And you spoke about various things like pettiness of the church, corruption in high places, search for pleasure and so on. Just a small question to begin with. Did you find the, the protagonist yeah. an interesting and likable personality? Just to begin with, Julian Sorel. Was he likable and uh, or was he not particularly likable? And uh, what was he searching for? Was he searching to just move up the social ladder? Yeah. Or was he also searching for a long lasting personal relationship with a woman? Was he searching for both and he didn't get either and that's why he committed suicide? Julian is certainly very interesting. Uh, I'm not so sure that he is always likable. You see, he is a, a likable uh, initially. See, he has been deprived uh, of love in the family. I don't remember if his mother was alive. If she was, she hardly mattered in the family. Uh, and uh, his father was a tyrant. In fact, just before Julian uh, is sentenced to die, his father visits him and condemns him and says, this is what happens to people like you who do not follow the decades of the church. Uh, so uh, even at the, although Julian had told the warden uh, and the uh, turnkeys, don't let my father enter, the father forcibly entered and reviled the boy just before his death. So, uh, I mean, he had this kind of a background and uh, I thought his attraction towards Madame de Reynal uh, was uh, uh, quite likable. Uh, I mean, in the sense that, you know, she was deprived of love. Uh, she had not known romantic love. And she's a very nice person, sincere. Uh, and, uh, you know, but given the society and social mores, things could not uh, really, uh, 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 you know, uh, flourish uh, without a lot of social criticism. I think the problems begin when he his ambitions uh, get the better of him. His mm -hmm. model, as you know, was Napoleon. He wanted to be like Napoleon, but everyone can't be a Napoleon. By the way, Julian Sorel has part of uh, the author's own personality. The author himself uh, did not die so early, uh, but he had a deprived background and he rose up. He was also a diplomat. He was a consul in Italy uh, and uh, he read voraciously. So I should say Julian is not entirely likable uh, and uh, he gets into a society, you know, which is... Uh, not his society. He has mm -hmm. not known this society. Mm -hmm. I think it's a misfit. And I did not quite appreciate his desire to die. You know, after all, at that point, he had got love. One of the critics, I think Mr. Croker, says something which, uh, with which I don't agree. He said, Julian cannot love. Love means giving. And Julian cannot give. He can only take. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a one-sided view, but... Uh, there may be some uh, truth in it. Professor, one more question before I um, throw it open to the others. That I yeah. do know that Stendhal was one of the great 19th century novelists of France. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in what way did this novel play yeah. a role in the development of the modern novel in France? Did it have a role in, you know, the development of the novel as a form? Yeah, certainly. I think in both, uh, you know, its orientations. One, very deep psychological probing. And that is something, I think, which was not perhaps followed in France uh, for a long, long time. In fact, I'm working uh, on uh, an article, very slow progress, on this novel and Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, you know, which Freud loved immensely. Uh, in fact, Freud said brothers Karamazov is the most magnificent novel ever written. Obviously, an exaggeration. So, you know, the whole idea of going deep into the depths of the mind. That is something which he pursued, which did not quite uh, become popular in France at that time. You know, but think about the picture of society. 
the novelist as great observer. You know, that's precisely what was a trend in the 19th century. If you think about the major figures, Balzac, I must say I'm not an expert in Balzac at all. Balzac was a fabulous observer and of course, um, prodigious in creation. Uh, uh, Madame Bovary is a wonderful piece of observation uh, and Zola depicted the whole idea of the author as an outsider, just observing things as a social biologist so I think in terms of the growth of realism, this novel played an important role. Mm -hmm. The other trend was not taken up till quite late. But I believe a lot of uh, you know, novels in England and uh, uh, Russia and uh, even Germany uh, took up the figure of uh, the, uh, I should say, uh, the upstart, or maybe that's not a good term, uh, you know, the young, uh, the Bildung's Roman figure the person who rises uh, you know, from the beginning and whose whole life is sketched. In England, for example, I should say that uh, George Eliot's The Mill on the Floss is a very fine example. Uh, and uh, much later, uh, even uh, a novel uh, like uh, Henry James's What Daisy Knew. See, but uh, this novel also doesn't start at the at the time of the birth, uh, many of Dickens's novels follow a similar pattern. So I should say that uh, in France, one of his uh, uh, you know, thrusts became very, very important. The writer is an observer looking at the whole thing from the outside. But remember that Julian Sorel is in many ways a self-portrait, in many ways. Uh, and uh, in the other contrasting thing about the psychology of the writer, I think that trend came a little later. There he is a, a real modernist. If you look, see, yeah. I'm thinking of the whole 19th century fiction as one, uh, you know, great whole, you know, with people like uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Turgenev in Russia and uh, Zola and uh, uh, Flaubert and uh, Maupassant uh, and earlier Balzac in France. See, Hugo was different. Hugo was a great storyteller and, of course, a great romantic. Uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Sinan, I'll may I just uh, request someone who would like to ask a question? Who's been waiting for some Mr. time, Mr. Chatterjee, yeah. to yeah. ask the question he wishes to. Yeah. Chatterjee needs to put on his mic and put on his video. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I've been a little too long in my answers. I'll try to be more precise. No. Mr. Chatterjee, please start your video. Is it Monali? Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yes, this is oh. Monali. Acha, and, Monali. Uh, I didn't know if it was. I just said <laughs> Chatterjee. Every, didn't say the whole name. <laughs> so actually, every time. Uh, in fact, I, I have got uh, this continuous message that says that my internet connection is unstable. So, and I've missed a good deal of uh, Professor Sina's presentation. Um, I, I'm still trying to turn on my video, but it says that your internet connection is unstable and your bandwidth is low and God knows what not. So I'll just, uh, am I audible by the way? Yes, yes, yes. you are. Yeah, okay. But, so, um, my question was that uh, I don't know if I've missed this, but uh, why is the novel called uh, The Red and the Black? I mean, uh, yeah. is there a, an explanation? I mean, have I, I don't know if I've missed this explanation. Yes, you not. have missed it. He did speak about it, but he can tell you again. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I'll tell you again. The black stands for the church and the red stands for the army or according to some people, republicanism. See, because uh, thanks to uh, the events in France, the social situation. It was impossible for a person of low birth to rise in the world. The two options were joining the church or otherwise uh, joining the army. Even there, at the very top, I suppose you had to belong to uh, a really noble family and so on. So Julian Sorel, a carpenter's son, wants to rise in the world and he is unable to join the army, so he joins the church. Uh, and so the choice between the red and the black and he chooses the black, but he also, in fact, uh, his father-in-law, uh, I mean, the man who, is, who refuses to be his father-in-law, uh, wants him uh, to be given a commission uh, in the army uh, so that he gets away, but that doesn't happen. 
in this case so also we should would anybody else like to ask a question prashant uh, let me talk about the uh, husband in law because he was also quoting somebody's wife no <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's a very interesting term husband in law sanjay sanjay saxena ji aap kuch bolna hai ye mujhe bolna hai mrs sena who would like to speak i haven't uh, i haven't don't see you please put Mrs. on your Sina. camera i, I will ask you Uh, yes please uh, uh, latika i was just thinking of another famous man who was the son of a carpenter yeah <laughs> <laughs> i thought there was some parallel here <laughs> yes or no he can think of carpentry is not such a bad thing after all <laughs> i'm keeping on jesus quiet <laughs> No, but I found if no one has anything to say, I'll just uh, I think, have a, uh, Latika, have a you know, comment. If Latika. anyone else was wishes to ask a question, Latika, I think Sanjay Saxena wanted to. Yes, uh, okay, Sanjay, please go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think uh, 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 we owe it to uh, to Prashant for such a fine presentation, and like he said, it's a book that not many of us have read, I, and I, I just want to know. Uh, I missed. Uh, uh, I joined late, so I missed some of it. You may have mentioned it earlier. But what is the correct message that the book gives? Is it that uh, if uh, that young men with ambition, talent, and enterprise could go far in society, or does it give the message that uh, it's not a good idea to to stray from the tried and tested, and you should recognize your station in life? Otherwise, the consequences could be nasty. Okay, or maybe. both those takeaways are probably mistaken what what do you have to say on this uh, parukh i'll agree with you but i think the view is closer to the second because given the society and the way things prevailed it was very difficult uh, for a person uh, from the working class to go up in the world you see mm. even people like napoleon didn't exactly come from the working class mm. you see and they rose in the world uh, so i think Uh, the society was in such a situation uh, that it was very difficult for a person without recommendations uh, without support uh, without uh, people to back him up to go up in the world uh, and uh, the author himself uh, mm-hmm. was ambitious and he did rise you know he ended as a diplomat uh, and he was even the consul uh, and uh, he wrote a number of novels uh, he had uh, i think he wrote something like 15 to 16 books okay. including collections of short stories and so on mm-hmm. so but the idea is that the social conditions uh, prevent you from reaching your uh, full potential thanks thanks very much so would you end by saying that uh, this novel is as much uh, a psychological study of different characters as it is a social analysis of the times both together yes. i think the two are very finely you know balanced together and he could do it because he's taken a very small canvas remember primarily there are only three important characters uh, julian and his two women hmm. uh, a lot of other people come in uh, and we can feel their presence for example abe uh, shelon uh, the marquis uh, the husband of uh, uh, the mayor the husband of madam de renal julian's own father you know but three characters dominate and remember the novel is not very short it took me uh, several weeks to read the entire novel <laughs> so did you finally come away thinking that the plot was quite dramatic uh, yes but i, I wasn't uh, expecting this kind of an end hmm. i thought you'll get some kind of a reprieve but it's very despairing then the end isn't it yeah that, that he, he, he dies and two other people die so two other women die so it's a despairing end yes that's uh, right can i can i hop in a little here please please latika the being not a person who read this book i mean i would just compare it to a dilip kumar movie you know in which <laughs> and there would be nargis and the whole movie is around dilip kumar the handsome guy singing songs in the background wooing the woo women at his own this troubling husbands and troubling fathers with mujhe in the context of napoleon and the king and the church and the politics it seems to be a proper novel uh, which is yeah. 
1955 movie like uh, Didar of uh, Dilip Kumar with Vina Those would be far narrower in their scope. <laughs> yeah. Those movies. <laughs> I yeah. mean, in the end, one person dies, the other person dies, the other person dies for the other person. It seems like a mushy climax in the end, you know, with maybe some song put in in, in an Indian context would be the right. Anyway, uh, there must be a social context in the novel because Prashant took a lot of time to read it, uh, provided, uh, I think the storyline was very simple, but the contextual situation behind it must have been pretty deep, Prashant, to give credit to your presentation. That is true. The, the, uh, the social context was delineated in con considerable complexity. Mm -hmm. And I should say that part of the problem here is that Julian is not a very handsome man in the traditional sense. No, he is not very tall. He is not very hefty. He is not very well built. He is not, as they would say, fierce. You know, he is very delicate and somewhat effeminate. And uh, it is with this personage that uh, Madame de Reynal falls in love, quite unlike her a dominating and dynamic uh, husband. But I think uh, part of the complexity lies in the presentation of the social reality and the avenue is not open to young men. So I don't think it's simply a love story. Uh, and uh, in Didar, if I remember correctly, uh, Ashok Kumar, the doctor, uh, you know, there is a very well-meaning good person. He doesn't realize that Nargis was at one time then Nargis is loved by Dilip Kumar. And don't forget that there was Nimi also in the novel. Yeah, in the end, Dilip Kumar it. again gets his eyes, then he breaks his own uh, breaks his own eyes and uh, quite a tragic end. Yeah, that is uh, true. You see, in those days, I think they, they love tragic, uh, uh, you know, movies. And Dilip Kumar obviously was a great, uh, I should say, tragedy king. Yeah. Uh, so I think the whole tendency towards having uh, happy endings uh, came only in what seventies? Yeah. Even in Sholi, remember? I think with uh, uh, Shami Kapoor. Shami Kapoor. Anyway, we have gone into Bollywood. See. So <laughs> yeah. Well, if no one has, we just want to ask you one last thing. If anyone else has a question, please go ahead. Tell me. There's nobody who has raised a hand. Okay. So I just want to ask you one last question, Professor Sina. You spoke about two things uh, that this novel uh, deals with. One is love and one is the pursuit of power. Are these two yeah. things what define, are the ones which define Julian Sorel and his progress in life? I, I think that is true. I uh, see he falls in love first of all with Madame Lorena. And I think it's a genuine love. Uh, with Matilda from the beginning, there is a, a kind of toss up between the two. And he wanted uh, power through love and he wants to rise in the world. Remember, Napoleon also rose a lot in the world. And Napoleon, I presume, uh, had uh, multiple women. Napoleon uh, was never totally devoted to any one woman. Uh, and I also believe Napoleon uh, was quite rude when dealing with women. He didn't have sophistication that would come from a noble birth and so on. I think Anna wants to say something, Anna. Yeah, I just want to say the two women are also very interesting because uh, uh, Ma Mademoiselle uh, Renault uh, yeah. obviously is attracted to this man who's very different from a husband, not yes. uh, so strong and dictatorial. And uh, the other girl seems to be rebelling against her station in life as well. That as a woman in that kind of restrictive society, uh, yes. Uh, I, I think they're also quite important. I don't know. That's what I think. What do you say? Uh, I think I'll agree. I'll agree with you. It's a fairly uh, acceptable analysis. Mm -hmm. I'll agree. Okay. Uh, anyone else? No? So, uh, can we call it a day? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sirha for bringing to our notice one of the you know, really outstanding works of literature in the history of French, the French novel. I have not read the novel, let me assure you. I started reading two, three chapters when I was young. And then for some reason or the other, it fell by the wayside and we went ahead. But we did study the novel in France. 
and we did study Samdal and also read a bit of the other novel called Shatra the Park. So we did get an idea of his style of writing and his realism, even though we couldn't finish reading the novel. So we're glad you spoke to us about this. It's a, in a sense, I would say it's a traditional novel in the sense that it talks about characters and they're swimming against the tide and uh, yes. the social order. Yes, always changing, but where tradition still prevails. So uh, thank you very much for this analysis and uh, see you next time soon with another prominent topic from France. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you for attending. Yeah, before thank everybody goes, Prashant, thank you very much. I just want to share with everybody that next week, we have a program by Dr. Robert, uh, Mr. Robert D'Souza, who uh, I'll just put the, I'll just share the screen and our, I'll tell you about next Saturday at 7.30, we have the program and it is uh, titled, uh, you know, like um, Kipling's Country. And I'll just put on the, uh, Mr. Ro uh, Ronald D'Souza is going to speak on his visit to three forests that he uh, came to in in, uh, in the month of February, that is Kana, Pench, and Bandagar. So he's going to, this is a program under Gyanpedia, and he's going to speak, calling the fascination of Kipling country by Robert D'Souza, a presentation on the Kana, Pench, and Bandagar National Parks. So that is next week at 7.30, and I request everybody to join. This is on nature. So Natika ji, Prashant, thank you very much. And with the permission of all, I will end the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ratika. Thank you, Farooq. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar, for the support.